detailed content of recent technological change and empirical exploration by David Author, Frank Levy, and Richard Murnane, published in the QJE in November of three. The starting point of this paper is the positive correlation that exists between the adoption of computers and the relative demand for college workers, skilled workers. And this has been interpreted as evidence in uh, support of the SBTC hypothesis. However, you know, this interpretation labels that correlation without explaining its cause. And so an important question is, why do computers shift the relative uh, demand for skilled workers? So can we open up that black box to understand better why it is that computers uh, seem to increase the productivity of skilled workers more than um, it increases the productivity of unskilled workers. And so this paper is mainly going to do uh, three things. First of all, it's going to build a model that's going to introduce tasks. So this paper is not the first paper to introduce uh, tasks, but I think it's the first one that put tasks uh, on the main map of labor economics. And so it's going to make that distinction between routine and non-routine tasks important to keep in mind is that whenever we say routine, we mean routine from a technology perspective. So what's difficult, or what, what's easy for computers to automate is what we will call routine tasks. And that's not necessarily the same as what we humans would call um, routine or non-routine. Say maintaining a garden might be routine for us, but might be non-routine for uh, technology and vice versa. You might think of say, you know, adding and subtracting is uh, maybe non-routine for for uh, human for humans, but might be very routine for um, technology. So routine means, you know, tasks that are um, programmable, codifiable in computer language, and automatable. And so, what this paper is going to do is going to build a model where um, where a decrease in the price of computers is going to lead to um, the automation of uh, routine labor tasks. Um, and um, at the same time, there's going to be uh, complementarities with, with non-routine labor tasks. And we're gonna also going to predict that these effects of, of shifts in a relative demand for, for uh, labor tasks are going to be stronger in industries that are initially more routine intense. And then, you know, we're going to take that model to uh, the data, test its predictions, and then end with uh, the question, so, you know, having looked at uh, computers changing uh, relative uh, demands in labor tasks, how does that map back into the canonical model of skill bias technological change? Um, and as the final um, section of the paper. So this is the um, agenda. Start with a task model, uh, introduce the task data, um, and then sections um, three, four, five are uh, the, the, the taking the model to the data, the main analysis. Uh, and then uh, section six, six is you know, taking the point estimates that we've derived in sections um, three, four, five uh, back to the canonical framework to see you know, to, you know, to what extent can we um, explain the observed shift in the relative demand for college workers uh, using uh, the underlying task uh, estimates um, and shifts in the relative demand for labor tasks that we analyzed in, uh, we will analyze in sections three, four, five. Okay, so the task model consists of, of two parts. Um, first of all, focusing just on, you know, kind of like the baseline demand for routine, non-routine tasks, and then um, introduce also an industry dimension. So, you know, routine and non-routine tasks, you have to think of those as, um, you know, being routine from a technology perspective. So that can be automated, can be codifiable, um, whereas non-routine tasks cannot be specified in computer code. So we're gonna have that distinction in the paper between routine, non-routine tasks. And at the same time, the paper also, for each of those two dimensions, the paper is also gonna um, have, um, that I mentioned analytic and interactive um, uh, or manual. So here is um, how you can represent those, those task dimensions. So you have two columns, routine tasks and non-routine tasks. And then you know, each of those is again, um, 
divided into analytic and interactive tasks and manual tasks. And what you see here are examples. So for example, an example of routine, ta routine analytic and interactive task is record keeping, calculation. Um, so these would be jobs that are, for examples of jobs would be office clerks um, that would fall into this, this, um, this part of the dichotomy. Um, then you, an example of a routine manual task would be picking or sorting repetitive assembly. So an example of an occupation here would be an assembly line worker uh, at, uh, in car manufacturing. Then for the non-routine tasks, you have uh, examples of analytic and interactive non-routine tasks on doing a medical diagnosis. A lot of occupations here would be you know, um, professionals, technicians, um, and then examples of a non-routine manual um, task would be uh, doing your, uh, so maintaining your garden. A lot of, of you know, relatively low paid jobs in services, um, waiting tables, cleaning rooms would be uh, non-routine manual because you know, even though we find them easy to do, it requires just some eye and foot coordination that we all learn as kids. Um, and that's also why they're low paid generally from a technology perspective, these tasks um, are, um, you know, not as easy to automate, um, nor is there any clear complementarity. Um, whereas for routine tasks, we think that there's, there's substantial um, substitution possibilities. Um, where, and for non-routine analytic and interactive tasks, there, there's, you know, we, we expect that there are strong complementarities. So you know, given this classification of, of tasks, um, we can then informally uh, make some assumptions that we'll, we'll formalize in a model in a second. So consider the following three intuitive assumptions. First of all, routine and non-routine tasks are imperfect substitutes. For the, the, the task dimensions to matter, they have to be imperfect substitutes. The second point is that computers are more substitutable for labor in carrying out routine tasks than non-routine tasks. I've given you some examples on the previous slide. Uh, and then the third one is uh, referring to these strong complementarities between um, computers and um, non-routine analytic and interactive tasks. So you know, we do expect that there's not just automation um, of uh, routine tasks, but we also expect that there's you know, relatively strong complementarities between computerization and uh, the productivity of um, the um, non-routine analytic and interactive tasks. So you know, can we write down those three assumptions um, in a, a production function? Uh, the answer is yes, that's what we do here. So assume an aggregate Cobb-Douglas production function where you produce output. Um, using routine tasks, which consist of LR are uh, routine labor tasks and C is computers um, and they're perfect substitutes. So you know, the term in, in brackets here are routine tasks um, and LN are non-routine tasks, which are just done, uh, can only be done by workers. Um, and so what we're gonna assume is that C is supplied perfectly elastically at price rho and then um, the price of computers is gonna fall uh, due to technological progress. And this is gonna be the, the causal force in uh, the model. So going back to um, my assumptions that I made um, on the previous slide uh, informally, are these assumptions indeed satisfied by this equation one? Uh, the answer is yes. So this production function implies the following three assumptions. First of all, the uh, elasticity of substitution between routine and non-routine tasks is, is one. It's a Cobb Douglas production function. Um, so it's finite. Uh, and so ta the task dimension, routine, non-routine, uh, matters in the technology. Um, second, C and LN are relative complements uh, relative to um, C and LR because the elasticity of substitution between computers and non-routine labor tasks is uh, one, whereas computers and routine labor tasks are perfect substitutes, so they have um, an elasticity of substitution that's equal to, you know, going to infinity. 
um, which implies that C is more substitutable for routine than um, non-routine labor tasks, um, which is you know, uh, what we intuitively um, wanted. And then third, um, we said that you know, we, we would also like to see um, strong complementarities between computers and um, non-routine labor tasks. And um, that's going to be the case because um, routine and non-routine labor tax or two complements, given that we have a constant returns to scale production function, which is basically saying that or implying that if, if I increase um, the amount of computers, so there's, there's capital accumulation in the economy, then the productivity of um, non-routine uh, labor tasks is going to increase. On the supply side, the, the paper introduces um, a ROI framework. So imagine that each worker is just supplying one unit of labor, um, but each worker is also endowed with uh, EI, where EI is an endowment of um, efficiency units to do routine labor tasks or non-routine labor tasks. And what the individual is going to do is is going to choose lambda i um, to uh, maximize income, where lambda i is um, deciding how much of your endowments you're going to spend doing either routine or non-routine labor tasks. And so, for example, if lambda is equal to one, then you know, i is going to supply all her labor uh, to uh, routine labor tasks. If i is, if lambda i is zero. Um, then um, I is going to supply all her labor to non-routine labor tasks. And, um, this is a, a ROI framework because what we assume is that there is a heterogeneity among workers uh, that's um, two-dimensional. Um, and so what's going to be important here is in this model is that we not only have technological change changing relative factor demands, but at the same time we have workers reallocating um, between um, tasks, between jobs, due to technological progress. So what we have in equilibrium is um, so the wage per efficiency unit of routine labor tasks must be equal to the price of computer capital because uh, they're perfect substitutes. Um, so WR is the, the, um, the price of one efficiency unit of a routine labor task. And um, you know, if the price of, of uh, computer falls, then that wage must fall, uh, given that they're perfect substitutes. Now define eta i as the ratio of n i over r i. So each individual has um, an endowment that's a couple r i n i. Uh, for each individual, then compute this ratio um, n i over um, r i. And this is something that we, if if heterogeneity is just two dimensional. Um, then you know we can reduce that to into um, a single parameter of heterogeneity by just taking the ratio, and so eta i is i's relative efficiency at doing non-routine versus um, routine labor tasks, um, and so individuals with a very low eta i um, will have a, a comparative advantage in doing. Um, routine labor tasks and individuals with a very high eta i have a compar comparative advantage in doing non-routine labor tasks. Also note that I'm saying comparative advantage because it's, it's your relative endowment that matters, not your absolute level of endowment. So this is a, a kind of capturing comparative advantage and sorting based on comparative advantage, not absolute advantage. And so there's going to be a marginal um, individual marginal worker with an eta star who is just indifferent between supplying her labor to routine or non-routine uh, labor tasks um, and for um, given wages wrwn you have um, defined eta star that's the eta star for the marginal worker and of course you know what's gonna um, happen in equilibrium in this model is that um, all individuals with an eta i less than eta star are going to supply all their time 
to um, routine labor tasks and all individuals with an um, eta i bigger than eta star are going to supply all their time to uh, non-routine labor tasks. That means that in equilibrium, what we're going to have is that this, so you can define g eta as the, the supply um, of uh, labor to um, routine labor tasks and uh, g eta is decreasing in eta, um, you know, the higher the, the marginal eta is, the higher eta star is, um, the lower will be the supply um, to routine labor tasks. And for um, h eta, which is the supply to non-routine labor tasks, the opposite holds. Okay, so um, productive efficiency then requires that um, the wage is equal to the marginal product of uh, routine labor tasks which is just given by, by this uh, derivative of the um, production function with respect to LR, where I've written theta now as the relative quantity of uh, routine over non-routine tasks in the economy. And um, the same for uh, non-routine um, labor. So in, in equilibrium, we must have that the wage is equal to the marginal product of um, non-routine labor task, which is just given by this expression here. And so what we have, so equations two to five is uh, giving you all the, the uh, equilibrium conditions that you need to solve for uh, the model's variables, which are the wages, a relative quantity, um, the number of um, routine tasks in the economy um, over uh, non-routine labor tasks, and eta is, is, is um, the, the, the marginal um, the marginal worker who is just indifferent um, you know uh, between uh, supplying her labor to um, non-routine or routine labor tasks um, so that's this, this threshold value eta star and then the question is so in this model so you know we're interested in what happens in, in equilibrium if there's a decrease in, in the price of um, of computers, so in decreasing the price of uh, C. How is this going to affect um, task inputs, relative wages, uh, labor supply? And, you know, from the expression of um, WR equal to rho, uh, you immediately get that the change in the log of ln theta over the change in the log of rho um, must be equal to minus one over beta, which must be negative. And you know, if I go back one slide, you know, what you do is you just replace this WR with rho, you take the logs on both sides, um, and you back out an expression for, um, so you differentiate, you back out an expression for um, the change in um, the log of um, theta for, um, so it's the change in the log of theta for a change in the log of rho, and you will immediately, you immediately get minus one over beta. Um, and of course, what this is saying is basically that in, if the price of computer falls, then um, there's capital accumulation in the economy. So what's going to happen is you're going to increase C. At the same time, you're going to reduce LR because they're perfect substitutes. Um, but the total amount of routine tasks relative to um, non-routine labor tasks uh, is increasing. That's what this uh, negative sign here is saying, and you can even quantify that's going to be minus one over beta. Okay, so um, what you can also compute is um, an expression for the change um, in the log of Wn over Wr if the price of computers is falling. Um, you know, remember that Wn over Wr is just equal to eta star. And you can show that um, this, um, this first term here is equal to the change in log of theta over the change in rho. And that's again, if I go back one slide, very simple to do. You just take Wn, you divide by Wr, and um, you'll see that then um, the, um, the change in that ratio relative to um, WR or rho is going to be the same um, to the change in ln theta, ln theta 
um, with respect to ln rho. So this term here is going to be equal to this term. And we know how much this is. That's just minus that one over beta from above. Um, so all of these changes here must be negative. And whenever I put um, a result in, in, a, in a box, it means that it's, it's, it's important. It's something to remember. And you know, this box really summarizes um, what's happening in the model in equilibrium. So what's happening is that if um, the price of computer falls, then the relative wage um, of non-routine um, workers over routine workers um, is going to go up. And that's because on the one hand, WR is going to fall, but also through the Q complementarity, the fall in a row is going to lead to capital accumulation, is going to increase WN. So in relative terms, uh, if the price of capital falls, then this relative wage must increase. What this second um, ratio shows you is if it's negative, it means that in a, a decrease in the price of capital is going to shift the eta star up, which is capturing that there's going to be a reallocation away from routine labor tasks to non-routine labor tasks. Uh, and then finally, you know, that's again just the, the capital accumulation leading to um, relatively more routine tasks than in the economy by computers relative to uh, non-routine labor tasks. And so, you know, this is really, you know, kind of everything that you need to know to, to understand the model. So basically, you know, what's happening in some is that you know, there's a decrease in the price of capital, and that's going to reduce the demand for routine labor tasks, you know, because you know, they're perfect substitutes. And at the same time, um, the demand for non-routine labor tasks increases through this Q complementarity. Uh, and you know, workers reallocate, and therefore, you know, because of these shifts in relative factor demands, workers are going to uh, reallocate from routine to non-routine labor tasks, as there is um, capital accumulation in the economy. Okay, so you know that's kind of like the, the basic model. Um, the, the problem with this model is that you know, if if you know, we've just started with a decrease in the price of capital, so if you want to test this model at this stage, you would take it to the data, but you would only have one single time series, you know, this, this decrease in the price um, of capital uh, or capital accumulation to test for the model. So what you can do is you can get additional leverage from uh, assuming different sectors J. And in these sectors having different task technologies in a sense that they have different beta j's. Now remember, beta j is the power in the um, Cobb-Douglas production function of uh, non-routine labor tasks. Also remember that beta j captures the, the um, income share for non-routine um, labor uh, in output. And so you know, what this means is that um, if beta j is, is large, it means that the sector is, is relatively uh, non-routine labor task intensive. But if beta j, or said differently, if beta j is very small, you're looking at a sector that's very intensive in uh, routine tasks. And what, what we do is so, so we can you know, add sub, uh, subscripts j to the model that we've just um, derived. And what we're going to, what we're going to show is that <clears throat> The more routine task intensive an in, in industry initially is, so the, the smaller beta j is, um, the more will be invested in computers, and the larger will be the decline in routine labor tasks and the rise in non-routine non labor tasks. So basically, you know, what we're gonna, so we've just looked at a comparative statics, so fall in the price of capital, and that led to the shifts in the relative um, in, in demands, in factor demands, and relative factor demands. And you know what this is basically saying is that these these dynamics are going to be playing out to a larger extent if you initially start off with a sector that is more um, routine task intensive or you know, the, or if beta j is smaller. To to show that um, 
you can start from a standard uh, Dixit Stiglitz um, formalization of the product market. So, you know, assume that industry J's production function is given by QJ, RJ to the power of one minus beta J, NJ to the power of beta J. Uh, that's the, the uh, production function um, in each sector, which is you know, the same as, as we had before. Um, and then we also assume um, that each sector is facing a downward sloping product demand curve um, that we derive from, from utility maximization. So the representative consumer is going to uh, consume all goods, so goods from all sectors um, using this CES um, utility function where um, new here is now one over the elasticity of substitution. And from um, this utility function, you can derive a, a demand for QJ, um, which is just given by, by this expression here, um, where P is the aggregate price index and PJ is marginal costs over one minus mu. And because um, mu is some number between zero and one, prices are um, above marginal costs, so constant markup over marginal costs. So that's just standard Dixit Stiglitz um, modeling of um, the, the um, technology and the product market. And from this, you can then derive um, the, the demand, the factor demands, the demand for routine tasks, the demand for non-routine tasks. Um, I'm going to do that here. So you get these expressions. Um, what I'm going to be doing or what I'm going to be interested in are um, two things. One is what's going to happen to factor demands if the, the price of capital is going to decline. And you know, given the model that we have um, derived um, before, you know, we know what's going to happen to relative factor demand. So you know, NJ relative to RJ goes up. But I'm also interested, second, I'm also interested in whether these dynamics are going to play out um, to a larger extent if, if beta j is, is smaller. And so you can uh, take logs uh, on both sides to get the following results. So the change in the log of rj, so the, the, the demand in, um, for, for routine labor tasks if the, the price of, of computer falls um, is given by this expression here, which must be negative. Which is, you know, as we had before, if the price of computer falls, then um, the um, demand for um, routine tasks um, is um, going to go up right? because of this, this capital accumulation. Um, so, you know, an increase in C. And, and, you know, we do assume that because of C and, and L are our perfect substitutes that uh, the demand for routine labor tasks is fallen. Um, but I also want to know, I also want to check whether um, this uh, comparative static, how it depends on beta J, um, and what this positive sign here says is that um, that um, increase in the demand for um, routine tasks, uh, if the price of labor, if the price of capital falls, is going to be um, bigger if uh, beta j is initially smaller. And you can do the same for um, non-routine tasks, which are non-routine labor tasks, because routine ta non-routine tasks can only be done by workers. And so here you have, um, you know, again, you know, if the price of capital falls, then uh, the demand for non for non routine labor increases through the Q complementarity, and it's going to increase um, more if beta j is smaller. Okay. Um, so you could think of j as a um, industry. You could also think of j as an occupation if you wish. But the, the bottom line here is, or the takeaway here is that so we've built a model that. Um, predicts that technological progress, computerization, is going to um, 
lead to these, these relative shifts in factor demands and uh, relative shifts in, in um, different types of labor uh, or labor doing uh, certain tasks. Um, and, you know, so we expect that um, a fall in row is going to uh, increase the demand for non-routine labor tasks relative to um, routine labor tasks. And workers are going to reallocate, um, therefore, from uh, routine to non-routine uh, labor tasks. And, you know, this is going to play out to a larger extent, the more intensive a sector or occupation initially is um, in routine tasks. Okay, um, so the empirical implementation, we have to start with um, you know, what are these task measures? So I'll say a few words about that um, and then already show you a, a predictive test. Um, and before we, we, we do the main analysis. So, the, the main data are uh, in this paper are, um, of course, you know, the task measures which are taken from the Dictionary of Occupational Titles. And the paper is using two editions, the 1997 edition and the 1991 edition. Uh, and then in terms of employment uh, data uh, or worker level data, um, they use the, the census 1% extracts for decades, um, so for, for 1960, 70, 80, and 90, and then also the CPS MORG files for 80, 90, and 98. And importantly, in, in those data, you have 485 census occupations uh, and 140 industries. So it's important to re realize that the, uh, the dot is an, an occupation specific measure of, of you know, what it is that people in those occupations do, the task content of what people do in those occupations for 12,000 occupations. Uh, and then you have, you have 44 um, task dimensions for each of these occupations. And so you can collapse that information to um, the 485, um, COC codes uh, to merge these task measure data into the worker level data. A final note is that um, we're mainly going to be using the 77 um, dot version. So basically what we'll have is we'll have just um, one um, occupation classification um, of um, task content um, using the 1997, the, the 77 uh, Dictionary of Occupational Titles. At the end of the paper, we'll also, um, towards the end of the paper, we'll also um, exploit the 1991 dot by looking at you know, how has task content changed within occupations over time. And the paper kind of makes therefore that distinction between, so you have extensive margin changes in tasks, which is, you know, keeping the task content within occupations constant, but then you allow occupations to grow bigger in terms of employment um, or smaller. Uh, and that's going to make some tasks in the economy more or less important. Um, so that's the, you know, using the, the extensive margin or examining the extensive margin changes in task content. But you could also, the paper also talks about intensive margin changes where you're going to look at how task content has changed within each occupation rather than uh, keeping it constant over time. Okay, so um, the, the 44 task dimensions are um, reduced into um, five dimensions. Um, the first one is um, what they call math which you have to think of it. So this is your, your you know, these are your technicians, your professionals. Uh, so what they measure is uh, non-routine analytic um, and uh, tasks. There's also another one, DCP, direction control and planning, which is a measure of non-routine interactive tasks. So again, you know, that would be typically be this, this you know, high paid non-routine job um, done by, by skilled workers doctors and, and, and technicians, professionals, etc. 
Um, so besides math and DCP, they also derive a measure called um, SDS, which is set limits, tolerances, or standards, which is, which is a measure of a routine cognitive tasks. So this would be high, for example, for uh, an office clerk. Um, Fingdex is, you know, finger dexterity, which is a measure of routine manual tasks. So this would be um, high for, for example, your um, car assembly line worker. And then finally, eye hand foot coordination is a measure of uh, non routine manual tasks. Uh, this would be your gardener or um, your waiter, your cleaner, and typically occupations that are um, relatively low paid, often in services. Um, because you know, eye hand foot coordination is something that you know, all humans can do. That's why it's so low paid generally, uh, but that, as, that is difficult for, for technology to, um, to do. And here you have examples, if you wish, um, of you know, specific tasks. So of those 44 tasks I mentioned, specific examples uh, of what goes into um, th these, um, these indices. The, um, so here, here are the, the data. Um, so um, you have the five task measures. Um, and if you just you know, look at some summary statistics, this is you know, across the 485 occupations, the COC occupations. Um, you see, for example, for you know, each of the measures is, is, um, has a support between zero and 10. That's what the, what these task measures are. Um, and you also see that you know, the means can vary a lot. So you know, it's, it's hard to think about you know, what, is, what does it mean to have a support zero or 10? And was it, what, what does it mean to have an average of almost four for math versus um, um, only 1.3 for eye, hand, foot? So the, 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 so the problem with these dot measures is that they, they don't have a, a natural scale. And they're also not easily comparable um, across one another. And so what the paper does is um, it, it's going to trans it transforms each, each dot measure into uh, percentile values corresponding to their occupational rank in 1960. Uh, weighted by occupational employment using the 1960 census. So basically, you know, what you do is you, you take, um, say, you know, a task measure, you um, rank occupations um, along, you know, this task, task measure that, that it has, so from low to high, and then you um, renormalize that task score into a percentile that is weighted by uh, the 1960 um, census employment um, information. So, you know, instead of zero to 10, we're gonna have you know, a number between um, zero to 100. And um, the, 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 the mean in 1960 of each task measure um, is going to be 50 by construction. And, you know, that's going to make it, um, when we interpret the coefficients, um, perhaps more intuitive to do, uh, and also is going to make these, these task measures comparable across each other, across one another. The paper also says that if you don't do that normalization um, and you just use the, the raw dot scores, qualitatively, um, you get identical results. Okay. So here is a, a first simple predictive test. What I've done is I've, I've um, um, you know, merged the, the dot with already with the, the 1960 census data. Um, and so, you know, I can, I can um, already do some interesting stuff with that. So uh, define routine tasks across occupations M in an industry J as, so, and define as RJ, as, so you have the uh, STS and FINDEX, these were the two measures of um, routine tasks. So STS was your office clerk, FINDEX was your assembly line worker. Um, and so in each occupation M, you just sum these two 
uh, scores um, to get an, an, a measure of how um, how routine um, a measure of routine tasks in uh, industry J. You can also do this for all five tasks rather than you know just these two. Um, which you know, is just the sum of RJ plus NJ, where NJ would be uh, the equivalent of RJ for uh, the remaining three tasks. And you can then compute the percentage routine task share for industry J as this measure RJ over um, RJ plus NJ times 100. And that's the, the routine task share for an industry. It tells you uh, in 1960 how routine task intensive uh, an industry is. And one thing that we took away from the model was that if you um, have a sector that's you know, initially more uh, routine task intensive, you would expect that in that sector, for example, the um, accumulation of capital and, and the um, intensity of computer use is, is increasing um, faster. And so what you can do is you can run a regression of um, a um, CJ is a um, computer use. So it's, it's the, um, the percentage of workers using a computer in industry J in 1997, uh, also normalized uh, to um, between zero and a hundred. And uh, you can regress that onto this, this initial routine task share in that industry. And again, what you would expect, if you believe our model, is that there's a positive coefficient, which it is, and it's significant. And so what this is saying is that in an industry that's, that's 10 percentage points in tensor uh, in routine tasks, um, you have that there is a 19 percentage you, you're you know you shift 19 percentage points higher up in the distribution of computer adoption and note that you know i'm using here just a 1997 computer use under the assumption that you know all these numbers would be zero in 1960 you're really looking at at computer adoption here so a change an increase in um in um computer use, um, assuming that in 1960, that was zero. Okay, um, but that's already, you know, in support of, of, of the model that we derived. Um, and and let's get serious about, um, about this thing. So uh, section three looks at trends in job task input between 1960 and 1998. And I'm gonna show you first some aggregate trends um, and then uh, talk about task changes within and between industries. So I think this is one of the, the main graphs in, in the paper. So what this is showing you is just the change in um, the, the mean task measure for each of the five tasks um, in each year or you know, each um, time period since uh, 1960. So for example, if you look at, um, say this one, non-routine interactive, that's this, this line here, um, by construction, the mean task um, input in, in 1960 is 50. And then if you see it going up, what that means is that over time, there has been growth in um, occupations that are relatively high up um, in the um, mean task um, on the mean task scale. So may, you know, maybe there's been growth in um, occupations that are um, having a, a non-routine interactive score at 75 or, or 80. Or, uh, and as these occupations have grown over time in terms of employment, you see that the mean task um, score also goes up. And you know, interestingly, what you see is that uh, since 1980, you see that the, the routine, uh, the non-routine task measures have become more important, and the, the uh, non-routine, sorry, the routine task measures have fallen, which is again 
kind of like in the aggregate at least evidence for you know, these kind of shifts um, away from routine towards um, non-routine occupations. And finally, you know the the um, routine manual is 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 a bit of a um, the, an odd one out, even though that I think the, the, the framework or the model is is pretty silent in terms of you know, there the doesn't seem to be strong substitutabilities nor complementarities for, for this group of worker. And in the main analysis in the paper, they also drop this last um, this last group here, and they just focus on these four um, these four other tasks. Now, you know, if, if the mean goes up, um, then I said that that must be that there's, there's been relative employment growth in, um, in occupations that have relatively high um, task scores according to the, 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 um, the 1960 kind of uh, um, task classification. Um, or task measure. And so, you know, for example, we were looking at non-routine interactive. What this is showing you is then the change in the density. So, you know, at, for example, you know, you see that at the 90th percentile, so these are, you know, this is an occupation that has in 1960, um, or, you know, in, in the dot 77 using the 1960 census to, to normalize those dot scores an occupation that's in in the in, in the, the 19th percentile um, of um, that uh, density in that occupation there's been relative employment growth and because you see that there's been relative employment growth in occupations that have relative high um, scores for for non-routine interactive that explains why on the previous slide this 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 solid line here was was going up over time. Okay, and you can do that for the other. Um, so also for non-routine analytic, you see that you know there is there is this this increase in in the mean over time uh, because there there is quite high growth at at the very top. Um, and for the routine ones, uh, it's um, it's different, of course. So one important um, exercise is to see whether you know these these task shifts, so the means that you saw increasing for non-routine and falling for routine, whether these task shifts happen mainly um, within or between industries. And I think it's interesting for for two reasons. Because one, if you um, believe that you know, technology affecting task demands and relative factor demands, therefore, um, if you believe that that's important, then um, you would expect to see also evidence for it within industries. In, in, in the literature, there has been this debate um, about, you know, if, if it's technology, you would not only expect to see it playing out between industries, but also within industries. Whereas, you know, if it's, for example, you know, trade, you would expect to see that playing out between industries, but not necessarily within industries. So, you know, the fact that you, um, you know, you would, if you would find evidence for an important, um, you know, task shift away from routine towards non-routine, even within industries, that would support the idea that that it's technology more than um, any sector-based explanation, such as um, globalization or you know structural shifts in the economy. Um, in the economy's um, sectoral employment for other reasons than uh, technology. Uh, the second reason is that um, if you, you, would you would hope for a, a strong um, within industry uh, component because that's what we're going to be um, living off uh, in the next section where we're going to be correlating um, changes or regressing changes in task content within over time within an industry to changes in um, computerization um, within an industry over time. So that, that's really using that, that um, within industry, um, those within industry changes in, in task content 
and you know hopefully uh, there are also those you know uh, within industry changes are also um, quali uh, quantitatively important okay so um, so what you can do is you can you know decompose this this change in that mean task input that I've shown you um, you know on on this on this graph so you know you can decompose this increase here um, which is just you know delta tk if k is non-routine interactive into a, um, a component that is the um, between industry component and a within industry component the between industry component uh, is just accounting for the fact that um, in some industries can grow bigger um, relative to others uh, keeping the um, uh, the the mean of task k in industry j constant at each at its um, average across years across years um, and then the second component is you know what we hope to see evidence for that's that within industry component um, and that is accounting for the fact that you know within industries you see this this change in um, in task use away from routine towards non-routine uh, keeping the uh, relative importance of uh, sectors um, constant. And so what you, you know you can do that. so what what you get is the following. So these are just again sort of the means that um, we plotted um, on on this graph that I've shown you before. Um, so you know going up from you know 50 to um, 62 so that, that's just you know, going up from 50 to uh, 62. Um, so these are the changes also broken down by gender. And then you can decompose that change into a uh, between and a within component. So for example, for the, the non-routine interactive, um, depending on, on you know, which decade you're looking at, you have the, the actual change and then you decompose that into a between and within component. And um, what you see is that um, the within component is, is um, quantitatively important, um, especially in the 1980s and 1990s. And uh, the same is true for the other non-routine measure. Um, it's also, um, an important dimension, those within changes, especially in, in the more recent decades, 80s, 90s. Um, for the, the, the routine measures, you, you can draw uh, similar conclusions. So they, um, the within components are, are negative and sizable, uh, especially in the later years, which is again suggestive that within um, industries you see this this shift in relative factor demands away from uh, occupations that are very routine intense towards occupations that are non-routine intense um, and so you know this is reassuring again for two reasons one it 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 does point to the you know importance of technology as a driver rather than possibly other um, forces of change that are more sectoral based um, if, for which you wouldn't necessarily expect to see these within components. And second, uh, these within components being important um, is also uh, kind of you know, setting the stage for the analysis and the main analysis in the paper that um, follows. So, you know, computerization and task change industry level relationships uh, subsection 4a really is that the main section in the paper uh, or your main empirical analysis in the paper um, so industry computer computerization and task trends over four decades so here we're going to be looking at uh, changes in computerization over time in a sector uh, and trying to use that to predict um, changes in in task contents over time within a sector and then sections 4B and C are just robustness, sort of robustness uh, tests um, that I will come back to in a second. 
Okay, so industry computerization and task trends uh, in the long run. So the model predicts that industries that adopt computers more will reduce routine and increase um, non-routine labor tasks more. And so basically, you know, what we have is that uh, we can test that. And so the change in um, the you know, task K in sector J uh, in time period tau, regress that onto uh, a constant and then um, a parameter of phi times the change in CJ, where CJ is the, the annual change in the percentage of industry workers using a computer. Now, you know, we only have that data uh, from the CPS um, for so between 84 uh, and 97. So this is just going to be, you know, one single um, observation for each sector. So this, you know, this, this, this one-off change over time um, in the, the, the instance of computer use in a sector taken from the CPS. So there's no tau subscript here. Um, and I'm going to come back to, to the fact that, you know, if you have this change in task uh, contents, um, say for the 1960s or 1970s, and you regress that onto um, a, com a change in computer use in um, the 1980s, late 1980s, 90s, uh, that might not be ideal. So we're going to be replacing this regressor here later on with um, more contemporaneous variables. Um, but then there are some drawbacks from doing that as well. So you no, know, sticking to this this um, main equation here. So equation thirteen is is really like the core equation in the paper. Um, the, the so estimate for what we're going to do is we're going to be of course interested in estimates of um, of phi, and um, mainly we're going to be interested in comparing estimates of phi uh, for the 1960s, 70s to um, the 1980s, 90s. Um, you could think of the 1960s, 70s as some sort of falsification exercise where you would expect that phi is, is, is not very important because, you know, that's the pre-computer era. Um, and, but that, you know, from the 1980s, 90s onwards, you know, you, you would hope to see um, bigger effects or expect to see bigger effects uh, relative to uh, previous decades. And that's what they find. So what you have is, so if you focus on the, the, the non-routine analytic tasks, um, it's change regressed onto the change in the computer use between 84 and 97 for each of these different time periods. So this is the 90s, the 80s, the 70s, 60s. Um, what you see is that the coefficient is, is, um, is positive, as you would expect for non-routine tasks. And it's, it's significant. Um, and you know, it's true in the 90s, it's true in the 80s. Um, and you know, the point estimates are bigger uh, for the 80s and the 90s than they are for um, the 60s and, and the 70s, you know, when they are only marginally statistically significant. Now, you know, how, how big is this coefficient? Well, so, so one way you can interpret this coefficient is by, you know, the, the size of this coefficient um, by also using the weighted mean of um, the, the dependent variable so that's that's 2.4, and so what you know, the, the mean of the change in computer use. I think it's it's reported in, in a note to this table, which I didn't copy, but the the the, the mean change in computer use is um, somewhere around 0.2. So you know, if you take about one fifth of this this estimate, 12, um, you know, you you get to about you know 0.2, say. Which means that you know the um, the change in computer use would be able to uh, predict almost all of the the change um, on average in um, in non-routine analytic um, uh, task use. And you know another way of saying that is that you know if you look at the intercept, it's just very, the intercept is, is very small, uh, which means that you know at the means um, you know your your um, 
your regressor is predicting almost all of the um, the change in in the dependent variable. So also, um, you know, so these effects are are not only you know as not only have the sign as you would expect and they're significant, but they're also very um, sizable. You can do the same for um, non-routine interactive, also positive and significant in the 80s, 90s, more so than in uh, the 60s, 70s. Um, and, you know, they're, they're sizable. And then for the routine um, tasks, of course, you would expect negative coefficients, um, as you find. And um, again, you know, they're, they're, um, they're stronger in the, uh, the 80s, 90s than they were um, in the 60s, 70s, and, and they're relatively sizable uh, as well. So note that here, I'm no longer using the five task measures. So the task measure that is dropped here is the non-routine manual. So these are the, 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 the cleaners and the waiters and the gardeners, um, these low paid service um, jobs. Um, for which we didn't have any strong predictions in um, from the model because we we didn't really know you know we couldn't really you know immediately kind of um, argue why these jobs would be uh, automatable or or you know the opposite complementary to technologies um, you know it, it is something that um, and so the paper is not going to focus on on the, that, that fifth dimension anymore. However, you know there has been some consequent so some some consequent research that actually focuses very much on on these low paid service jobs um, that in in terms of relative employment have grown over time, um, and that was part of the the kind of like the job polarization debate that we also talked about when we were discussing the handbook chapter. Um, and there's some some um, other interesting research looking into um, the, the rise of low-paid service work. But you know, we're not going to focus that on, on that uh, anymore in this paper. Okay, so two robustness sections for B for C. Um, what for B does is it's going to use uh, composite dot variables. So basically, the idea here is that what we've done so far is we've handpicked um, classifications where we're doing this, this dimensionality reduction in uh, the 44 dot task measures into these five indices that we think are also you know, informative about how technology impacts uh, the labor market through uh, task content. And so you could say, well, you know, that's just you know, arbitrary, it's ad hoc. You should use um, something like a principal component analysis to um, to make sure that these these tasks that you put into each of these indices, four or five indices, um, are are kind of maximizing the the uh, variation uh, that you have across these forty four task dimensions. Uh, the drawback is, of course, that you 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 lose a little bit sometimes the intuition of. Um, how exactly then it, it correlates to what technology can do or not do. Um, so, you know, but, you know, the paper does that um, without uh, finding any um, results that are, that are qu uh, quantitatively different. And so, so they're qualitatively identical. Um, and um, I think more importantly, uh, subsection 4C, is uh, going into that 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 issue that uh, what we had on the um, left hand side were task changes in the 60s, 70s, um, whereas on the right hand side we had the change in computer use uh, only in the late 80s, 90s. Uh, so it's going to look for contem contemporaneous measures of of computer use and capital investments, and that will then also have um, some some drawbacks. Okay, so. Um, First of all, so these, these are the, the composite task measures. I'm not going to go into that. Um, this is just, you know, re so recalculating these, these uh, four task, task uh, dimensions using um, a principal component analysis rather than handpicking tasks going into uh, each of these four. Um, employing contemporaneous measures of computer and capital investment. So, um, 
as I said, one, one difficulty is that the CPS computer use measure only exists for the, the late 80s, 90s. Um, and, you know, and using that on the right hand side and then having something, some change on the left hand side that's happening in the 60s, 70s might not be ideal. So what you can do is you, you can find um, measures of, of um, computer and capital investments uh, that go back further in time. So from, from 1959 onwards, uh, from the NIPA, the National Income and Product Accounts. So what you can do is you can, uh, and this is now just, you know, stacked differences. Um, so stacked first difference models. So basically what I was doing before, I'm just now putting into one single regression, um, stacking the different um, decades. So the change in uh, task K in sector J um, in decade tau, I'm now going to regress that not on, on computer use taken from the C CPS, but uh, computer investment um, and then uh, capital investment taken from the, um, the, the NIPA. Again, you know, now the advantage is that I can have these, these, um, these tau subscripts here. So I can, you know, do this by decade. Um, and, you know, also note that, you know, because I have a, a stacked first difference model, so I, I stack the decades, uh, I can plug in um, these time fixed effects. Now, one drawback of using the NIPA is that in, in contrast to the CPS, where I had 140 industries, the NIPA has only 42 industries. So the industry aggregate, so the industries are more aggregated in the, the NIPA, than, NIPA than they are in the, the CPS. And both the, the fact that um, I have, you know, a stack difference model, so I'm, I'm you know, having more decades uh, in, in a single regression equation, together with the fact that uh, this, this CI is measured at a more aggregate sector level than the task change, those two um, are, are um, making the authors think about you know, how to cluster their standard errors and they do it in, in two ways. Um, so, you know, you can cluster at the, the NIPA decade level. So you have 42 NIPA sectors, you have four decades. Um, so you have a total of 168 clusters to account for you know what's known as as molten aggregations molten's aggregation problem so accounting for the fact that um you know your your nipa sector classification is more aggregate than um the um 140 industries for which you have um task change data uh you can on top of that you know you might also be worried about zero correlation um, in the variance covariance matrix, matrix of the error term. If you will also want to account for serial correlation, you're going to have to um, go to uh, even fewer clusters, so 42 clusters. Um, and that's, of course, going to um, further blow up my standard errors, but it's going to allow for um, not just aggregation, but also um, serial, cor serial correlation. So for um, to just to pause, so I think, you know, clustering is um, an industry in itself. And I think, you know, today, um, especially since 2003, I think we've, we've um, advanced very much also in how we, how we do it um, in our statistical packages. I guess most of us now just to comma robust uh, in our statistical packages, but it's important to, to, um, to understand, you know, what do we mean by um, Moulton's aggregation problem? What do we mean by um, clustering for serial correlation? So here is a, um, a small kind of um, excursion, um, a very intuitive excursion into clustering. So consider a, a, the, a variance covariance matrix of residuals um, where I have n observations. So what the variance covariance matrix would, would be is you have, of course, the, the diagonal um, is just, you know, the variance um, of E 
1 to En. And then off diagonal elements are um, covariances. So, you know, for example, you know, this term here is the covariance between E1, E2. The next term, the same uh, row, the next column is, is covariance E1, E3, um, etc. And um, so what OLS is basically, if you would just run an OLS regression and OLS is going to compute standard errors for your, for your point estimate is that uh, basically OLS is going to assume that all these off diagonal elements, all these off diagonal covariances are, um, are zero. Um, and also note that, you know, the variance covariance matrix is symmetric. So I'm just focusing on, um, um, you know, on, on the, the, the top um, triangle. Okay. So, you know, let's, let's assume here now that um, you have, so, you know, observations uh, one and two are, um, Know, in a in a in a subsector that are in two sub are in, in a subsector that belongs to the or in subsectors that belong to the same more aggregate uh, sector A, and three and four are in uh, subsectors that belong to the same more aggregate um, subsector B. So, so you know. In 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 the the, um, the paper that we were just discussing. So one and two could be one of these 140 sectors. Um, and then A would be, um, so in, in the CPS, and then A would be a more, one of these 40 more aggregate sectors in, in the NIPA. So what, what, what you're concerned about then is that um, it could be because one and two belong to the same more aggregate sector A, that um, there are correlations, or there is a correlation between um, the residual E1 and, and E2. So this element here, um, you know, which, is, which is the same as this one here, is non-zero. And, um, you know, so, so, but again, you know, if, if you would just ask Stata to uh, compute your standard errors, um, Stata would assume it is zero, so one way to account for um, that these correlations due to aggregation is to cluster your standard errors. Um, and you're basically going with what you're doing is you're basically going to allow for um, covariances in this in this um, in this this box here uh, to be non-zero. So off diagonal elements. Um, in this in this um, in this block here to be non-zero, and you know the same for um, you know if if three and four belong to the same more aggregate uh, sector B, you you want you you might want to allow for um, the covariance um, between E three and E four to be non-zero. And that's basically what Molten's aggregation um, problem, how you can solve that. You, you cluster your standard errors um, by, um, by NIPA. Um, and let, let's assume that you know, this is all you know, happening in the same decade, so by NIPA and decade, um, which is you know, allowing Stata you know, um, to, to um, to have these, these off-diagonal um, covariances uh, that are non-zero. Okay, so now let's let's think of another example where um, you have observation one and two. Um, they're actually in the same subsector as observation observations three and four. Um, and one and two are, um, th they both belong to the same aggregate subsector A, and you observe one and two at time T. Three and four are in the same 
subsector as you know one and two respectively um so you know they're all they're also both in a but now not at time t but at time t plus one now you know now you might want to be concerned also that there is serial correlation so that um you have that not only um this covariance is uh, non-zero because of, of the aggregation problem, but also that um, this covariance here is non-zero because of serial correlation. Um, and so, you know, to account for both aggregation as well as serial correlation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to um, think of, of an even um, bigger um, an even bigger um, block that um, is going to allow for even more of these covariances to be non-zero. And so that's why in the paper we have, you know, the paper presents two sets of standard errors. The first set of standard errors is just, you know, is clustering at the NIPA decade level to account for um, the aggregation um, the more aggregate sector classification in the NIPA than in the CPS. And the second set of standard errors is, um, so, so and, and, you know, and that will be in total uh, 42 times four, so 168 clusters, or you know, these, these, these blue squares. Um, if you also want to account for serial, or you know, allow for serial correlation in a variance covariance matrix, um, what you're going to do is um, you're going to uh, cluster just at, at the NIPA level uh, that will only give you 42 um, clusters or, or, or squares uh, and standard errors are even going to be um, are going to be even um, bigger because you allow for even more uh, off diagonal um, elements in the covariance variance covariance matrix that are non-zero. So that's that's the intuition of um, clustering, but um, so I um, and I'm going to leave it at, at this. So I'm not going to go into to the kind of the nitty gritty of clustering uh, and, and what, for example, robust clustering means if you would um, type it into your stata command. Um, today but you know I, I think for now it's 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 um you know at least enough to understand what's happening in the paper um so what they do is they um so you have you you, you have the change in for example non-routine analytic um and you you in each decade and you run that onto um the computer investment per fte measure in logs then you see that for these non-routine measures, both analytic and interactive, you find a, a positive coefficient. And then you have the two sets of standard errors where the first set is just accounting for aggregation. The second set is um, accounting for both aggregation and uh, serial correlation. And you, you see that you know, these point estimates um, are, you know, they're actually not statistically significant for non-routine analytic, but they are for non-routine interactive. Um, and they also are for um, the, the routine cognitive and manual task measures. The um, variable uh, capital investment is, you can think of it as just the control um, or the capital labor ratio. If, um, you know, you don't want um, so you basically want to look at computer investment, uh, controlling for um, other types of, of capital accumulation in the economy. So you have your, your time dummies. Um, and so basically what, what this is saying is that you know, even if you use um, more contemporaneous measures of uh, computer investment, and then you know, accounting for the drawbacks of only having that information at more disaggregate sectoral levels, um, 
then you know you you still find evidence um, strong evidence in support of the um, predictions that the model was making okay so uh, section five is um, is taught, so it's about task changes within our, uh, education groups and also uh, within occupations and both are um, interesting um, exercises um, because the looking at within industry task shifts by education group um, is going to tell you something about you know whether or not the task shifts that I've that we've documented in the previous section um, are happening also within education groups and you know if if that's true and we're going to show that that's true then it, that suggests that tasks are are more kind of you know, granular more fundamental way to think about how technology impacts labor markets uh, than thinking of skill as 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 the um the proximate dimension through which um, technology affects um factor demands so and then you know the, the second um subsection is going back to the fact that you know we have two dot versions the 7791 and so we can also test for um, whether even within occupations there's been this this shift away from um, routine towards non-routine okay so you know, task changes within uh, education groups so, Assume that educated workers have a comparative advantage in doing non-routine labor tasks. So imagine that the eta i is higher for educated workers. And you know, what we've shown is that there's been this, this shift towards um, non-routine labor tasks and against routine labor tasks. But you know, in theory, that could be explained by an increase in the relative demand for educated workers due to computerization if if educated workers have a um, comparative advantage in so have higher eta i have a comparative advantage in, in doing non-routine labor tasks now you know so one critique to what we've been doing so far could be to say well that's what you're picking up here isn't really you know technology changing uh, relative tasks and therefore relative factor demands but it's what you what what is driving the changes that you 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 documented is really skill bias technological change so one way to um deal with that critique is to say well if we would expect if we would see the same task shifts um as we've documented before if you would see those same task shifts even within education groups this is something that the um Canonical SBTC model couldn't explain, which would suggest that you know it's it's really tasks that are driving um, uh, SBTC rather than the other way around. Okay, so um, and basically what you can do is you can take that that main equation thirteen, um, you can run that run that again, but now you know for each um, for each education group I. So again, you're going to look at the change in task content K in sector J over time by education group. So you have an education specific intercept, you have an education specific um, uh, phi I um, if uh, that's going to be uh, predicting uh, task changes uh, of these changes in, in computer use. Um, and I'm focusing here on the task changes um, only from the, the 1980s onwards uh, to kind of you know, stick to that, you know, um, to almost contemporaneous um, use for data uh, from the CPS computer use AD 497. So, you know, what you see is that um, this is the, the uh, aggregate within industry change. I'm more interested in uh, looking at these uh, regressions by education group so this is for the group of high school dropouts for the group of high school graduates and the next slide does it for for call for some college and college graduates and you know by and large you see um evidence uh, in line with with um predictions that even within these education groups there's been this this um 
shift in relative factor demands away from non-routine towards routine uh, labor tasks. Uh, and then finally, you know, so, so what you can of course also do is to um, decompose the task changes um, into a component within and between education groups, just as you know, in, when we were discussing the aggregate trends, we were also decomposing those um, aggregate trends into uh, a between and within industry component. Uh, you can do the same not for sector, but for um, education. And um, so these are the, the percentages of the actual changes explained um, by the uh, within and between components. And you see that, um, for example, this is non-routine interactive, the um, within component, also for the routine measures, the within components are um, quantitatively very important. So, so it's really also happening. So, so it's really also important what's happening within education group, uh, rather than um, task changes being driven by, by um, occupations, um, or, or you know, uh, more skilled occupations um, becoming more important. And so um, what, what this again is saying is that um, the, um, kind of the, the way that technology interacts with the labor market is, you know, it, it has an impact on tasks uh, and um, that's gonna change um, what's happening even within education groups. Uh, and, you know, as we'll show later on, that's also going to be driving um, what's happening between education groups in the canonical model, um, rather than SBTC being kind of like the, the, the more fundamental force that explains the task changes that we've documented so far. Task shifts within occupations. Um, so this is going back to um, a comparison of the 77 and the 1991 dot measures. Uh, so the dot measures are um, they're, they're task descriptions by occupation um, that are um, written down or done by experts. And so an example, for example, of an example of, of secretary uh, from the uh, Occupation Outlook Handbook in 1976 is that secretaries relieve their employers of routine duties so they can work on more important matters, etc. In 2000, that, that same occupation was described and the tasks that uh, had, a secretary had to do uh, was described very differently by these, these experts. Um, uh, labeling, you know, these 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 um, task dimensions to these um, occupations. They say, as technology continues to expand in offices, the role of secretary has greatly evolved. Office automation, organizational restructuring, etc. So what this is saying is that even within occupations, there might be um, a role uh, for technological change. And again, you know, if if you take the the, the model. Um, Seriously, what you would predict is that within occupations, there's been also this shift away from routine towards um, towards non-routine. Um, so, so, and you see that you know in 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 seventy five or in seventy six, um, you know secretaries were doing routine duties, um, and um, in um, two thousand, um, you know. It, it was, you know, technology had changed what, what these secretaries did. Um, and, you know, there had to be a lot more um, creative in terms of doing non-routine tasks than, than the routine duties that they, they had to do initially. So this is just an example. Maybe we can um, get more, more um, general evidence from this regression equation where you now look at the change in uh, task K in occupation uh, M over time, and that's just you know really exploiting this 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 different score that these experts gave in the two dot measures and the two dot releases. Um, so that change in task content within an occupation, you can regress that onto the uh, change in um, the uh, computer use 
in that occupation, again, taken from the CPS. And, um, and then the, the XI is, you, again, you know, you would expect that to be positive for the non-routine tasks and negative for uh, the routine tasks. And that's what you find. Uh, for example, if you look at the non-routine interactive tasks, the coefficient on the computer use um, is um, computer use is, is positive um, and significant, even if you start controlling for um, you know, the the um, changes in the task content within occupations that are driven by uh, either the changing composition in terms of um, education or gender uh, in each of these occupations. And, you know, again, if positive um, estimates on computer use for the routine and negative for the non-routine task, which is kind of suggestive again of the idea that even within occupations, you see um, that um, the model seems to be at work to some extent. Well, the other thing in the final section of the paper is to take the uh, task estimates that they have um, shown in the previous sections to the canonical model to see to what extent the um, increase in the relative demand for college workers as estimated in the canonical model can be explained by underlying uh, shifts in relative demand for, for, for task inputs um, and workers doing different tasks. And so um, it, the reason why they do that, of course, is that the economic significance of these task shifts isn't clear, given that they, they don't have a um, familiar scale in, in the canonical language. And so to meaningfully quantify task changes, what they will do is they will um, take the estimates in, uh, from the previous sections into um, to the canonical model uh, of skill bias technological change. And they do that in three steps. So the, the first step uh, is that they, they estimate a um, fixed coefficients model where they uh, take a year, say, you know, you take 1980, and in 1980, you regress the college share of sector J uh, onto the, the, the task measures uh, TJK, and um, you get estimates for pi k. Then you take those um, estimates for pi k to predict changes in the aggregate college share by taking um, the, the estimates for pi k and um, multiplying that through with changes in the task measures um, over the period that you're interested in, in this case, you know, 1798, for example. And you predict the uh, change in the college share over that same period. And you can take different, different um, um, variables as your change in TK. Uh, you can take the observed changes that we documented but you can also predict, you can also take the predicted changes from the analysis that we did, where, you know, for example, equation 13 was predicting task changes using the, um, within sectors, using the um, within sector change in computer use from the CPS, or, you know, the more contemporaneous NIPA measures of computer investment. Um, and, you know, those are both you know, predicting changes um, using between occupational variation in, in uh, task content. And then, you know, we also made predictions of um, task changes using the within occupational variation um, um, because of the, the, the different labeling by experts in, in the, the dot issue, in the dot versions, the 77 and the 91 dot version. And so what I'm going to show you on uh, the next slides are um, these, these um, changes in task measures, actual and predicted 
from uh, the analysis of uh, we did before. And um, I'm also going to then show you what, you know, taking those um, changes in task measures together with, you know, these, these um, phi, phi, uh, predicted phi case, um, what the predictions are for changes in the college share. Now, before we do that, one um, remark is that um, if you look at equation 18, the way we want to interpret that is uh, as changes in um, the college share, um, you know, so, so a shift out in the relative demand for, for college workers driven by uh, shifts in, in demand for tasks or relative demand for tasks. So again, you know, shifts um, out for the demand in, in, in routine and uh, non-routine tasks and, and shifts in for um, routine tasks. And um, the, that's how we want to interpret those changes. Now, the, um, and, you know, driven by, by uh, computerization, if once we start using these, these predicted changes. Now, imagine that technological change is, um, is say, increasing the demand for um, non-routine uh, labor tasks. And imagine that that has an impact both on, on the quantity of uh, non-routine labor tasks, as well as uh, the price of, of non-routine labor tasks, you know, um, the relative price of non-routine labor tasks. Then, you know, this, this quantity here that we observe isn't going to be exactly uh, the, the amount with which the demand curve shifts out, because part of the, the shift out in the demand for non-routine labor tasks is, is, um, tr is translated into higher relative prices for uh, non-routine labor tasks and not just an increase in quantity. And, you know, it, so what we don't do is, um, you know, if, if you would um, want to back out, you know, if that would be the case, and you would want to back out the, the, the really, you know, the, 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 the shift out in a relative demand for non-routine labor tasks, you would have to um, basically adjust um, this, this, this quantity that you observe um, into a, a shift out in the relative demand for non-routine labor tasks, which would be, which would basically imply that this, this pi k also becomes a variable you know, depending on um, the, the elasticity of demand for uh, non-routine labor tasks, as well as um, by how much the, the relative price has changed. We're not going to do that. So we keep this, this coefficient um, phi hat k fixed. And that's why it's also a fixed coefficients model. And you know, th there's two ways in which you can then um, interpret what we do. The first way is to say, look, you know, we, we're going to just take the quantities that we observe and we're just going to, you know, uh, think of those as, as, you know, actually, you know, accurately capturing these um, demand shifts and whatever is transmitted into um, changes in relative uh, task prices, that's just going to be an underestimate of, of the shift out in demand. Uh, and so you know, it's also going to relate, uh, translate into an underestimate um, in the shift out of the demand for, for college workers relative to uh, non-college workers. That's one interpretation. Um, the, the second interpretation is that you, you, um, you'd argue, well, you know, if, if task technologies are such that um, they are um, used in fixed proportions, so technologies like Leontiev, then, you know, if there is an increase in the demand for uh, tasks, then that's just going to be translated into quantities, not prices. Uh, but that, you know, implicitly assumes that the uh, elasticity of substitution um, between uh, tasks in, in a task production function um, would be uh, zero, or, you know, also that in, in, in predicting the, the, the college share, that the um, elasticity of substitution between skills uh, is zero because they're used in fixed proportions. Uh, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, but let's first see, you know, what, what measures we have for um, the, the, the delta t's, changes in tasks, and, you know, what, how that results in, in changes in um, 
predict the changes in the quality share. So um, the panel A in this table um, gives you, these are the um, actual changes in the task measures. Uh, and panel B gives you predicted changes in the task measures uh, from um, changes in, in computer use. And um, the changes in computer, so these predictions using changes in computer use, we said, you know, there's different um, predictions that we've made in the paper. So if you focus on uh, the period 8098, which is the entire period, then, um, and you just focus here on uh, these predictions. Um, those would be coming from uh, equation 14, where we have used the um, NIPA contemporaneous measures of, of, of computer investment to uh, predict changes in um, each of these four um, tasks. Um, you can also use equation, equation 13, which was using um, as delta CJ, the, the computer use um, in a sector or changing computer use in a sector between 84 and 97 or 98. And, um, and you can make also, you know, a set of predictions using um, uh, those point estimates. The columns one, two, three are um, still using the NIPA but then, you know, for previous periods, so you know, 90, uh, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, and um, so column six um, is using the um, so column six is using equation 16 you know, that was basically doing this this you know, uh, within occupation change in task. Uh, content estimated on um, within occupational changes in computer use for the 1980s, 1990s. And then the final column, column seven here, is uh, combining from the CPS measures, uh, combining predictions uh, using between occupational task variation, that's uh, column five, and within occupational task variation predicted by these, these CPS measures um, and you can just add those um, to, um, to get the final column seven. Okay, so what you, so these are the delta t's. We also of course then have uh, the predicted change in the college share and um, panel C is giving you the predicted change in the college share as a function of the changes in the actual task content. So the actual changes in task content. So that's just basically panel A. So you take these actual measures here and then you know, with the fixed coefficients that you have estimated before we started this table, then you, know, you get the predicted change in the college share um, as panel C. And then panel D is gonna show you the predicted changes on the next slide. It's gonna show you the predicted changes in the college share as a function, not of the actual, but of the uh, predicted changes in task content because of computerization uh, from panel B. So panel D is um, the predicted change in the college share as a function now of the uh, predicted changes in task content that were taken, that are taken from uh, panel B. And um, so that's basically, you know, all the variables that I had listed on this slide. I've given you um, the different versions of the um, changes in task content and then from that, the different versions of uh, predicted changes in the college share. And we want to compare those predictions as, um, so we want to compare those predictions with um, shifts in the relative demand for skilled workers 
implied by economical framework. So what they do in panel E is they start by you know, estimating just the canonical framework. So remember that the canonical framework is just um, a change in the log of college workers over non-college workers. Um, and then you had uh, something that was shifting the demand minus one over sigma the elasticity of substitution between college and non-college workers change in uh, the relative quantities. And so what you can do is you can basically, you know, if you have uh, changes in um, the return to college and you have changes in relative supply and you assume a sigma, you can back out the implied change in the relative demand for um, for college workers um, in from this this um, canonical model of, of skill bias technological change. What the paper also does is it gives you uh, it does that so it estimates delta d for different parameter values, where sigma equal to one point four is the consensus estimate. We, we know sigma is, is somewhere between, usually somewhere between one and two, and 1.4 seems to be um, a consensus point estimate. And um, they also show um, delta D for an assumed elasticity of substitution being equal to zero. And that is because, remember, we've used this, this fixed coefficients model where we basically, you know, um, have implicitly assumed when we were computing these, uh, predicting these changes in uh, the college share that um, college and non-college workers are um, Leontiev, so fixed proportions, which would be consistent with this idea that you know, the elasticity of substitution is zero. Um, and um, so that's also why they, they show um, predictions for delta D using that parameter value. And then the, the final part of, of um, panel E is, um, is actually, you know, are the, the um, predicted changes in the relative demand for college relative to non-college workers from the, the um, panels um, C and D. The only difference, the only reason why, um, so, you know, for example, you know, this, this number here is the predicted um, shift out in a relative demand for college workers relative to non-college workers due to computerization. So that's taken from panel D. But you see that, you know, this 2.29 and this 3.65 aren't the same. But be careful because what I'm predicting here in, in, um, in, in the, so what the 2.29 is, so this is a predicted uh, change in um, relative quantity of um, college over non-college workers. Whereas in um, panel D, I was predicting the change in the college share, which is not the same as a, um, as NC over um, NNC. Um, so, you know, you have to basically from this, this, this share change here, which is NC over the sum of NC and NNC, um, you have to back out um, the predicted change in, in the relative um, demand in terms of quantity of um, skilled or college over on over over uh, non-college workers so that's why the, you know that's why you know these two numbers are not the same um you know you just need to have to take that that intermediate step but um that's where it coming but that's where it's coming from more importantly uh let's look at um you know this 2.29 and then compare it to the um the, the predicted or the implied shifts 
in relative demand from the canonical model. And I'm just focusing on, on 1980, 1998, so the last column, but the same is true for the other columns. So you can you, you immediately see that this 2.29 is is sizable relative to uh, what you would get from the canonical model. Um, it explains some, between 60 to 90 percent of um, the, the implied shift from the canonical model um, out in the relative demand for, for skilled relative to uh, unskilled workers. And what this again suggests is that the task framework that we have developed um, is at a very granular level uh, contributing to, in, to, an, uh, to, an, to an important extent uh, to the shifts that we observe in the relative demand for skilled workers due to what we call skill bias technological change. I think a final point is also that the, the recent task-based frameworks are therefore not inconsistent with the economical model of skill bias technological change. I think the way you have to see these task-based frameworks is as more granular, providing micro foundations for uh, the more aggregate uh, canonical model. But sometimes you hear discussions or you hear people argue that um, these models are not consistent and you know that um, the canonical model is um, is not accurate. It's 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 still accurate. Um, in a sense that you know the, the the observed or the implied shifts in relative demand for skilled workers are there because you know there's underlying task shifts uh, from non-routine from routine to non-routine tasks from which um, skilled workers benefit relatively more. Uh, of course, you know where these two models do differ is in their in their um, interpretation of you know how technology impacts on on workers or the labor market so sbtc taken literally would would force you to think of some reason why uh, technologies are um, increasing the productivity of skilled workers more than of unskilled workers whereas i think task-based frameworks would argue that technology um, impacts on you know, the labor tasks that people can do, that workers can do, and it's gonna displace some workers from um, some tasks, done, routine tasks, done, uh, and it's gonna force these workers to reallocate to uh, doing non-routine labor tasks. And you know that's a, a, a different way to think about the impact of technological progress, even though that um, in terms of, of, of um, analysis and, and um, quantitative um, analysis, the, both economical model as these task-based frameworks are uh, not inconsistent as this exercise has shown. Okay, so to um, wrap up, uh, this paper develops a simple model of how computers substitute for workers performing uh, routine tasks and how it complements workers doing non-routine tasks. Um, we have, um, taking that model to the data and um, in different ways uh, have found support for uh, the model. Um, and importantly also, it seems that this, this task-based framework can explain uh, in, in changes in task content due to computerization can explain uh, an important part of, of the observed shifts um, in relative skills, um, skill demands that we that we see uh, in the um, canonical model.